I know a few good stories. They take place in a corner of America that might seem familiar, yet still manages to surprise. The settings are spectacular, the characters compelling, the action exciting, the plot lines unpredictable. I'm Tom Richardson. Join me as I explore New England's great outdoors, from Candlewood Lake, Connecticut to Caribou, Maine, from the beaches of Cape Cod to the peaks of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Stories are waiting. Let's live them on Explore New England. Explore New England is brought to you by Down East Magazine, the magazine of Maine, and visitnewengland.com. Additional funding and support for this episode was provided by the City of Warwick Tourism, Culture, and Development Department. Many people know the City of Warwick on the western shore of Upper Narragansett Bay and just south of Providence solely as the home of TF Green Airport, which serves as a convenient hub for air travelers in southern New England. However, just a few minutes from the tarmac and terminals, you can find yourself in a very different world. A world of natural beauty and wild things. As an avid birder and member of the city's Wildlife and Conservation Commission, Kate Fitzpatrick knows all about Warwick's surprising diversity of natural spaces. To show me some of them, Kate met me at the mouth of Mary's Creek in the northwest corner of Greenwich Bay for a short birding expedition at low tide. So Kate, this is Mary's Creek, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, obviously a beautiful marsh environment. What, what sort of bird species could someone expect to encounter here? Yeah, you're going to see a ton of wading birds. That's going to be your great blue herons, your snowy egrets, your great egrets. Um, you're going to see some smaller birds. Um, you saw some plovers this morning. All sorts of ducks come through here. It's a great stop for migration for them. I was here the other day and the American black duck was out here. There's so much food here. It's just such a rich coastal resource for, for all sorts of aquatic life and for the birds. So mm -hmm. it's just a great spot to stop and feed or, or maybe nest. We see all the colonies kind of hanging out in the tree line. And so I noticed that there was a bunch of a bunch of uh, egrets and stuff over in that one tree. Are they nesting in there? Yeah, a lot of times they kind of come together as like a colony, especially at this time of year. Oh, they all get along though, huh? <laughs> yeah, they, they tend to. You know, when there's enough food, they don't mind kind of colonizing. There's kind of some safety in numbers. Oh, that's a good, that's going to be a good shot right there. This small tidal creek provides important habitat for a variety of wading birds, shorebirds, and shellfish, as well as a protected nursery for juvenile marine fish. As a wetland, it also serves to filter pollutants from the surrounding watershed and provides a natural buffer from storms. Yeah, so at low tide, all these like mud flats are all exposed, obviously, and that I'm imagining opens up new possibilities or more possibilities for food, right? Food gathering, right? Yeah. It's easier to see, you know, it's not quite as deep. Everything's kind of burrowing in, so they can kind of see everything scurrying around and kind of pick them off. This is a huge quahog nursery, so it's a Title I um, water protected federally, um, particularly for quahogs. Yeah, there's, I see minnows dimpling the surface, so this is a big nursery for mama chugs and all kinds of other fish life. Rich environment, there's all kinds of crabs, shellfish. It's like a little oasis here, you know, in the middle of Warwick. Yeah, and it's such a suburban area. You know, Warwick's done a nice job with that, protecting a lot of different habitats and environments. After our morning at Mary's Creek, Kate and I drove a short distance to a very different natural space. Acquired by the city in 1999, Dolly Forest comprises 63 acres of thickly wooded land 
with parking available in a small lot off Coesset Road. Here we are at Dolly Forest. It's 63 acres of conservation land, just recently permanently protected through a new Rhode Island law, which is awesome to see. It's a great spot for woodland birds. It's a different world entirely. Yeah, and you, you never really know it's here, right? You could drive by it 10 times. So how many different species of trees are in this forest? So we've got 18 identified. It's primarily an oak forest, which is what makes it such a great habitat for woodland birds. Yeah, it's so much cooler here in the forest. What kind of bird species have you seen here? Oh man, I've seen so much here. This is almost a little hot spot during migration. We've got all sorts of warblers, parm warblers, yellow rumped, black and white, a lots of birds singing, the rose-breasted grosbeak, the scarlet tanager, just these birds that people really don't think you'd find here in Warwick, you know, in kind of a really suburban area. I think when you get out in the forest and you're looking for birds, just really stimulating to your senses, right? You're listening, you're looking, you're in these beautiful places. You're really kind of taking your time as you go through the forest. You never know what you're gonna see. You never know what you're gonna find. I just love being out here in nature. Yeah, I hear a wood peewee. Yep, doing his, his infamous callback, <laughs> peewee. You can hear him, yep. can't see him. <laughs> yeah, they love to sit way up high in the canopy in that sunshine. Carolina Wren. Dolly Forest isn't very big, but it contains a few surprises, including a small stream that flows over and through moss-covered ledges and boulders. So this is the famous pond I've heard so much about. Yeah, it's a great spot for frogs. We see ducks on the pond, a lot of red-winged blackbirds out here. And you said there was a pair of wood ducks that nest here? Yeah, last year we actually saw nine baby ducklings on the pond. You know, they don't really care too much for company. Nine of them? It was pretty magical. The sun was setting, they were kind of just jumping through the water. Really? Yeah, it's great. It doesn't take a visitor very long to encounter surprises in Warwick or stumble across pieces of history. And if you pay a visit to Clouds Hill Victorian House Museum, you can check both boxes. Built in 1871 as a wedding gift for Elizabeth Ives Slater upon her marriage to Alfred Augustus Reed, the ornate Victorian era home is perched on a hill overlooking Greenwich Bay, although many people drive right past it. Clouds Hill president and curator Ann Holst is a direct descendant of the Reed family, and she grew up in the magnificent house, where she still lives. She's also a font of Warwick history, as museum visitors will soon discover. We created a museum here so that the public would be able to see what it was like living in the 1800s, because this house has never been closed down for the winter even. 1872 it was started, it took five years, it was finished in 1877. And everything in the house is either original to the house or they are pieces that passed down through the family as people died and people inherited. So if anybody wants to know anything particular about any particular age between 1870 and today, I can find things in the house. Just give me enough time to look for them. This house is considered by some people to be the most complete Victorian house left in America because it has all of its original furnishings. It has uh, fresco work that was done by the most important company in the United States, McPherson Brothers. It has all of its original textiles, the, the curtains, the rugs. So there's all kinds of things in the house and we do special exhibits from time to time on different facets of everything. And then if you go on the grounds, uh, we have about 70 species of trees and shrubs on the grounds. A lot of them are marked. They're small plaques that give you the common name, the Latin name, a picture of the leaf, and maybe a little brief fact. And that's our arboretum. Clouds Hill also comprises a nature center containing a collection of curious historic items, from traditional eel pots to taxidermy mounts 
all of it relating to fishing, hunting, and natural history in Rhode Island. It's just another surprise in this most surprising of museums. When Clouds Hill was built in the late 1800s, Warwick looked very different from the present day. Much of the land had been cleared for agriculture, and the shores of Greenwich Bay were crowded with small working vessels. The city also boasted several industrial mills by this time, which required the damming of local rivers to provide hydropower. One of Warwick's early industrialized rivers is the Patuxet, which flows into Patuxet Cove on the northern edge of the city. Today, the river once again flows freely to the ocean for its last four miles or so, thanks to the removal of an obsolete dam at the head of the cove. The lower half of the river makes for a diverse and intriguing paddling venue, as I discovered on a kayak trip with Angie and Luke Murray, starting at the roads on the Patuxet Park and launch area. How long is the Patuxent River? That is a good question. I don't know overall. <laughs> I it's should pretty, have an answer. It's pretty that. long, though, right? It's long. Yeah, it's it's miles, and like I said, you can you can tr pretty much travel all the way from Western Rhode Island, which is Situate Coventry area. There's a couple branches that meet together um, around West Warwick, Rhode Island, and then it, it merges into this, which then dumps into the ocean. So mm -hmm. um, there's plenty of kayaking, more than you can do in a day. What I really like about paddling first thing, it gets us to have time together and away from the crazy life that we live working full time. This is something that we like to do to get away from the rest of the world. We also like that it's in nature. It's with the trees, with the water flowing, with the quiet sounds of sometimes we hear the frogs and the toads. It's relaxing, um, it's fun, it's time away and we learn a little bit too. When you're on the river, you see a, a different viewpoint of the places you, you see every day. Um, and in addition, there's a lot of history in New England. A lot of that history is on the river. So these dams, the mill complexes, um, remnants of old bridge abutments, you kind of question why that's there. And then what happens a lot of times, I'll go back and I'll look at photos for what used to be there and you learn a little bit about the history of the area. So it's just a lot of opportunity for, you know, looking at the history of the area, natural beauty and the bonus is that we get to spend time together. So. Angie, Luke and I made our way towards Patuxet Cove. Just above the Broad Street Bridge in Patuxet Village, we paused to assess the rapids leading to the saltwater portion of the river. Unless you have whitewater kayaking experience, this passage is best attempted at high tide when the water level between the cove and the freshwater section of the river is more even. Heavy rains can also make for a wild ride, so use caution. Luke, Angie, and I made it safely into peaceful Patuxet Cove, home to several marinas, as well as the annual Gatsby Days Parade, which commemorates the burning of the British royal schooner Gatsby in 1772, one of the first violent acts of colonial protest against the Crown. Well, for a lot of people, that was the kickoff of the Revolutionary War, the first dissenting act. Um, that was prior to the Boston Tea Party. So that's celebrated every year right here in the park. Mm -hmm. And they have a little boat that they float down here <laughs> representing the burning. And they have beer tents and festivals and it's a whole month long celebration operated by multiple nonprofits. This, this village has a lot of both cultural significance from the Narragansett Indians who are here who lived and worked and fished along this land to the colonial times to present. 
and uh, yeah, it's a great place to be. The next stop in my exploration of Warwick brought me to the opposite end of the city, on what is known as Potawatomi Neck. Nearly half of this peninsula is occupied by Goddard Memorial State Park, a sprawling 490-acre property that offers many opportunities for outdoor recreation, from boating to horseback riding. Goddard Park was donated to the state by the Goddard family in 1927, in memory of Colonel Robert Goddard who served in the Civil War and later as a Rhode Island State Senator. The park grounds originally featured a former Victorian mansion known as the Oaks, which burned in 1975. Today, only a couple of entryway stones mark the location of the structure. I got a personal tour of the park with manager Scott Landry. All right, so just launch right into it, man. Tell, tell me about this awesome beach you got here. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, quite a bit of beach during the day on low tide. Uh, we have room for about 300 cars down here mm -hmm. and all summer long. Yeah. Uh, pretty much packed down here. So Is it free? It's free here. There's no charge. Oh, that's pretty cool. At the northern end of the beach is a bathhouse in the park's nature center, where you'll find numerous tanks housing live fish, shellfish, and other critters. It's a cool place for kids and adults to learn about some of the animals living in the park's woods and waters. Eighteen miles of bridal trails wind through the park. These trails can also be used for walking, running, and biking, but horseback riders have the right of way. There's even an equestrian center run by CNL Stables where visitors can get riding tours of the park. Family and group rides are also available. Goddard also features an affordable nine hole golf course. Cost is just 15 bucks on weekdays, 20 on weekends, and tee times must be reserved via the park website. The park's free two-lane launch ramp on Greenwich Cove was rebuilt in 2016. It offers plenty of parking, a convenient tie-up dock, and access to Upper Narragansett Bay. A trail that skirts the shoreline of the cove is a popular spot for hikers and shore fishermen. After my tour of Goddard Park with Scott Landry, I headed back north to check out Warwick's other state park, Rocky Point. For well over a century, this 123-acre parcel of land bordering Upper Narragansett Bay was home to a popular resort and amusement park that operated from 1847 to 1994. At various points in its history, it hosted a professional baseball park a steamship dock and shore dinner restaurant, a theater, an arcade, thrill rides, a carousel, and more. After the amusement park closed, the property endured nearly 20 years of disuse and vandalism. Eventually, the land was jointly purchased by the city of Warwick and the state of Rhode Island for use as a public park, and now features a long fishing pier and miles of walking and bike paths. Jody King remembers visiting Rocky Point as a kid, but it wasn't to spend his money on roller coasters and arcade games. Rather, it was here that he learned the skills that would eventually serve as the foundation of his entire career. Now 63, the affable and energetic King has spent over 40 years raking a living from the waters of Narragansett Bay, and he does it year-round in every kind of weather. He's also a natural teacher, frequently conducting instructional classes on shell fishing for the state's Department of Environmental Management. So you'll be actually in that shallow of water? No, no, I was in 19, 20 feet of oh, water this morning. Getting little necks there? With a, with a big rake, uh -huh. getting cohogs. Oh, cohogs, right, okay. Cohogs, yeah, well, that's with a rake a about that, 
Oh, no. No? You see, you're not from Rhode Island. <laughs> Only in Rhode Island they call co everything that you catch that's a hard shell clam is called a quahog. We separate them when you go to the market to little necks, top necks, tops, cherries, and hogs. Okay. Jody gave me a personal lesson on how to rake quahogs, which proved to be a real workout in that rocky bottom. And you have to get literally under the rocks to catch any quahog. Okay. As you pull back and forth, and, 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 how, and what, uh, when do you stop? When the rake is full. Oh, hey, look at that on my first one. First rake. There you, you go, huh? Rookie. Oh, it's an undersized. Look, I got two. <laughs> yeah, you had to beat me, right? Yeah, to... look. Yeah, yeah. Sure oh, enough. I brought the bottle. Look at that. Once I start finding them in a spot, I don't move. You don't move. At eight or nine years old, my parents used to walk us down that beach, four boys, and go, don't go past those rocks, don't go past that street, catch some quahogs and don't kill one another. So I literally say, I cut my teeth right here. If every I Rhode Islander has the inalienable right to walk down to the shoreline every day of the week, as long as the area is open, and catch a one gallon pail of clams with no license at all, seven days a week, and catch a hundred little necks every single time they walk down. It's beautiful. Growing up here in Warwick, I'm the oldest of four boys. My parents didn't have a lot of money, so we used to come down to Rocky Point and hang out and have a picnic at the beach. My parents would literally say, fill your buckets with quahogs so we can have a dinner. I could never imagine 50 years ago making the decision to dig these for a lifetime cohogs in Rhode Island for a living for more than half of my life and I'm 63. Who has a better office than I do? Absolutely nobody. I can go on my boat, I get to take my dog to work every single day. Look at this, one. See, that's a big one. That's two, three, four. I think that's a good rake. This is my rake what we call the harvesting basket. These are the nine or 10 or 11 teeth, depending on the rake. They come on the rake. You have to get all three and a half or three inches of these teeth in the bottom in order to catch the quahogs. You can actually catch clams anywhere. It doesn't have to be a sandy bottom, a muddy bottom. This is called Rocky Point, and you catch way more rocks here than you catch quahogs for that reason. They are hidden in the rocks. So in order to catch them, you gotta dig a lot of rocks. And these are by far, in a rocky bottom, the best clams you'll ever eat. One of my favorite things to do in Rhode Island is to teach Rhode Islanders how to catch clams on the beach. I've been doing a class called Come Clam With Me for 12 years now for the Department of Environmental Management and it's mostly to bring Rhode Islanders down to the shoreline, show them that they can catch a meal, take it home and eat it. I get the pleasure of seeing someone smile when they catch a rake full of clams and they get to take it home for dinner. I've taught you how to catch clams. I'm gonna teach you how to cook a meal on the beach. So I've fixed you up for life in Rhode Island. There's nothing quite like raking up a bushel of quahogs to spark one's appetite. And Jody had planned for that as well by bringing all the ingredients we'd need for a steamed clam feast, based on a simple recipe handed down from his father, who worked as a chef in a well-known Providence restaurant. So we put the quahogs and the sauce in the pan with very little water because each quahog has its own liquor built into its shell that as it gets warm, it will open up and drop its liquor into the pan and that starts the steaming process along with the olive oil garlic, basil, and crushed red pepper. Oh, that looks cool. That looks neat. And that's why you need Italian bread. This is my best day. 6,049 pieces in four hours. Proof that I did it. There's princess on the 6,049 clams. There's dad on the 6,049 <laughs> clams. And there's Jody on the 6,049 <laughs> clams. As soon as the first five or six clams open up in the pot, 
I shut the heat off and let the rest steam in the pot without the heat underneath. You don't want to overcook these and make them tough. Freebie. Okay. <laughs> hey, that's cheating. Oh, I love the wampum shell. <laughs> oh, fresh out of the bay. <laughs> oh, man. That is good. After 30 something years of eating these, they're still good. All right, let me try one of these things, man. See, I'm not doing it right. I didn't pay attention. It's all right. It's all right. Is there, a, there's, is there there's a wrong no, way to do it? There's no right or wrong way. Mm. Mm. I love that salty broth. And that's now against the bay you're eating. Yeah, right. I love that. My name's Jody F. King, and I am a commercial wild harvest bivalve extractor from Warwick, Rhode Island, and I love my job.